Hello, hello, and welcome to the Compliance Crosswalk Podcast, where we discuss the intersection between security, privacy, compliance, and risk management. My name is Blaise Wabo, your host, and joining me today is Patrick Sullivan, my very good friend. Patrick, welcome. How are you, sir? I'm so well. Thank you so much for having me today, Blaze. Very, very grateful for you. Very good. Super excited for this particular session. And guys, today we're, we're discussing Alliance 2023 Compliance Benchmark Survey. And uh, Patrick, I'm excited to dive into this topic with you. I can't wait to discuss it with you. We had so many um, relevant findings to share with the community this year. Uh, but yeah, yeah, super excited to be able to share. Very good. Very good. So, Patrick, why don't you start by just telling uh, the, our listeners here just a quick recap. I know we've been doing this for a number of years, but yeah. what is a compliance benchmark survey and what's the process of doing the survey and why does Align do this uh, year after year? Well, such a good question, Blaze. And this is something that, you know, I think in our field, uh, we work with the same sorts of organizations year over year. We see the same sorts of things year over year as it relates to how people implement their compliance programs, as it relates to gaps in vision for what organizations are seeing um, in relation to their compliance programs. And, and so through the years, we began to tell ourselves a story um, about the pains, about the misunderstandings that various organizations had as it related specifically to compliance and their compliance programs. Um, and, and so three years ago, we decided to actually test our assumptions. It, you know, we thought we're seeing these things, we're seeing these these currents of these common themes across various customers, across various verticals. Why not take a step back and actually apply a little bit of science to this so that we can bring in empirical data to support the anecdotal data that we already had? And that's really what led us to launching the inaugural benchmark survey, which was our first attempt at applying the scientific method to really testing our assumptions. And please, you remember the scientific method is basically five steps. So first of all, we make an observation. And we had, that we had seen, again, common themes, common patterns. But we asked a question that, you know, is this true? Ultimately, is the question that we began to ask ourselves, are these misunderstandings, are these gaps really as pervasive as they seem to be? We ran some tests, and so we actually formed an, an experiment to begin testing in the market, in the field, to, to see if we could support our assumptions, our observations with real data, um, which is what led to the fir first survey that went out. You know, once we got responses from that first survey, what we analyzed it, we put together our initial report, and, and then we shared that information with the community. And so we've done that. To your point, uh, for three years now, and year over year, we've been able to further refine uh, through the questioning, through the surveying of various populations uh, to really shore up and really form a more high definition understanding of what it is that the market needs and where the market gaps really are. In effect, we can say today with some pretty decent confidence that we understand what pressures various organizations have as it relates to their third party and regulatory compliance. Now, how do we do this? How do we actually run the experiment uh, through surveys? And so this year we opened up a survey. I forget the overall ask, but we had just shy of 600 respondents uh, reply to our survey to provide us data to then be analyzed. Uh, which again, this year has given us more granular detail, a more granular view um, into what's really driving organizations of various sizes. Right. right. Yes. No, thank you, Patrick. Thanks for the description there and uh, the overall process for our audience. That's a good recap. And maybe, Patrick, I should have started by just saying, you know, how about you describe a little bit what your role is at, at Align and how you service that customer success? Oh, my goodness. So I serve on the customer success team at Align, uh, yeah. which means my job is clearly undefined in many ways. Ultimately, it's my responsibility to ensure that those organizations that choose to partner with us actually receive the full benefit of the relationship. And so, Blaze, you, you know all too well that Again, various organizations, various personas 
um, have different drivers, which means there is no one size fits all approach to really serving organizations well as they build their compliance strategy. So ultimately, it's my responsibility to ensure that we take a step back and think about how to truly step in and partner so that, again, we're creating value via shared resources, a little bit of ours, a little bit of theirs. We get to the end goal in a successful way. Absolutely. And Patrick, one of the things you always say that I always like is creating value through shared resources. Yes. I think that's very important because um, in the industry in which we are, cybersecurity, especially with a focus on compliance, organizations, their day-to-day -day job is not to do compliance, right? right. They, they have their, their different organizational objectives and you know, the fact that we are a trusted partner and really play that role and try to add value to their to their organization is really important. So going beyond that checklist process to actually adding value to the organization, right? Absolutely, Blaze. And in fact, that was one of the core findings that we walked from this year's survey with was that more and more organizations are really understanding that compliance can be a value driver, not just a cost center for their organization. Yeah, as an example, I talk about personas that we see. And in our respondents, again, we hit close to 600. We broke up our respondents into two different categories, one by vertical, so IT services, cloud services, healthcare, one by uh, revenue, so zero to five million, five to 50 million, 50 million to a billion, and then over a billion. So essentially a view into startup, small business, mid-large enterprise. And so as we look at those two influences, we can build a pretty good persona for as an example, a healthcare organization generating over a billion dollars a year. And we saw that those personas had one set of drivers, one set of influences that really colored and informed how they made decisions. Conversely, an IT services startup making less than five million a year had totally different drivers. Regardless, across the board, we saw that most organizations, I think somewhere north of 80% of organizations said, yes, we understand that compliance can be a value driver. It just so happens the smaller businesses see more value in compliance and winning business. As an example, I think we've all seen in business to business relationships, a SOC 2, a SOC 2 type 2 attestation can really be table stakes. We've seen organizations lose business because they didn't have that basic level of assurance that they could provide their customers. So in small businesses, um, actually earning compliance it is a way for them to win new business and avoid losing business. What we saw above the $50 million mark and, and really the mature organizations, the mid-large to enterprise, is that for them, they were saying compliance really is a governance tool, a way to create real value as it relates to how they serve not only their customers, but the market at large which was just fundamentally different than what we've seen in the past. So much more maturity as it relates to how people are thinking about really driving their mission and really driving, minimizing risks as they do what they do with their customers' data. Well, Patrick, thank you. Thanks again for that quick recap and uh, sure. you know, tying the essence of compliance, the why, to the business strategy, right, and the day to day, and uh, obviously last week you were at the, you were presenting this particular results at the, the ISACA Digital Trust Conference in Boston. How was Boston, first of all? Oh, Boston was incredible. Boston was absolutely incredible. We're at that time of year that the mornings are cool, but the afternoons are warm. Right. Uh, so it's as if Mother Nature knew that we were coming and did everything she could to make it as easy and enjoyable as possible. Awesome. I'm sure everything was green and looking really nice. Yeah, it's the allergies. So I apologize for my stuffiness. No, no, that is that is perfect. It's that time of the year, you know, yeah. seasons change and that's the beauty of this uh of this country. So yes, yes, yes. Very good, very good. So at the conference, what were some key takeaways that you presented in this particular year survey? And uh, you know, if you if you don't if you care to also highlight what are some key differences as well that we, uh, we've we seen this year from the previous two years? And what's interesting, and I'll, I'll start with the differences. Um, 
what was interesting this year is that the differences weren't as much differences in kind as they were in degree. And by that, I mean, really the three biggest takeaways that we wanted to share with folks um, at ISACA with a group, a, a group similar to ours, people that think deep, deeply, that is, about compliance and how it impacts and affects business. Uh, really, the three key takeaways is that were that, that is, consolidation, as we think about consolidation across multiple audits, multiple standards, is still something that most everyone recognizes can relieve a burden, can bring value in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, to that end, and just some numbers uh, for sake of context. Uh, of our 600 respondents, 600 or so respondents to the benchmark survey this year, um, about 88% recognized that consolidating would bring value uh, to their organization. Consolidating either by scope, by resources, by um, attestation, by standard. Uh, we saw that 84%, I think is the appropriate number, somewhere in the mid 80s, of organizations that responded were doing two or more audits. Over half were doing four to six audits, different audits. So thinking about this, that means two to four would be potentially a, a SOC 1, a SOC 2, ISO 27001, maybe PCI. So the vast majority of respondents to our survey were doing multiple audits. The vast majority recognized that consolidating those audits would bring value either through time savings, cost savings, lack of burnout for their internal staff, which turnover is still a significant issue that we've seen this year. Um, the eye opener and the really troubling statistic, and, and this is a statistic that we didn't necessarily pull last year, but we did this year, 94% of those organizations are not consolidating. So what we're saying, by and large, most everyone, and that's a generalization, but I feel comfortable making it, most everyone recognizes that consolidating their efforts makes sense and is something that should be done. At the same time, nine out of 10 organizations are just not doing it yet. Uh, so this is something that we've seen year over year. Again, it's not a difference in kind, but a difference in degree, in that this year we can cleanly state how pronounced the issue really is. And so I think about the, the macroeconomic pressures that most organizations are under today. We see lots of turnover from technical teams. Really, for the first time in a long time, we're seeing turnover in security teams and compliance teams. Now, more than ever, it becomes critical that organizations really become proactive and create a compliance strategy that, if not marries with their business and technological strategies, at least compliments in some way, shape, or form, and at least it is treated with the same regard, with the same level of importance as those other strategies for organizations. Um, so really one of the first big key takeaways is that people are recognizing that consolidation is the way to go. It seems that there are blockers, there are obstacles, which frankly, I think is just a lack of knowing where to start. Uh, but there are blockers that are keeping organizations from actually taking appropriate steps to help themselves. Um, the second key takeaway um, is that more and more organizations are using compliance tools. And Blaze, I think this is something you and I are very familiar with. I think this is something probably everyone is familiar with. It, you know, I think back to when virtualization started becoming really popular 15 years ago, when we saw this prolifer proliferation of tools that organizations could use to virtualize systems in various ways, shapes, and forms. And it took several years for the market to really settle out and for clear leaders to emerge. As an example, what we see with what Azure is doing with Microsoft, uh, with what VMware has done over time, and to, to some extent what Citrix has done. We're starting to see that now in the market as it relates to compliance platforms. Uh, so more and more organizations are using compliance platforms or tools to help themselves pre prepare for audits. Now, again, degree not kind, we've been seeing organizations use compliance platforms for years since we began the survey. The eye-opener in our inaugural benchmark survey 
about 22% of respondents were using some sort of software to help themselves prepare for their audit. This survey, so just three years later, 88% of respondents are using some sort of platform to help themselves prepare. So a 4X, a 400% increase in proliferation and use of these software tools. And my expectation is it's just going to continue to grow and it will continue to become more cloudy until it becomes less cloudy. And we begin seeing some real consolidation in this field as well. Yes. Um, really the third big takeaway, um, is the value and compliance. And this is something that I, I talked about as we began kicking things off, more and more organizations are saying that their compliance programs, while not yet, um, a value center, um, do have potential to actually create value for the organization, whether it's in earning new business or whether it's in just creating a strategy that allows the organization to think more cleanly about their compliance posture over the long term. Absolutely. Yes. Creating value uh, using shared resources, right? Going that back. Is, that is partnership. A little bit of my, a little of yours. Let's create something very, yes. <laughs> yeah, the trust partnership. You're <laughs> so right, Patrick. And I think to your point, a comparison from the Inaug inaugural um, um, benchmark survey to three years later, we can see a vast increase in uh, organizations wanting to consolidate their assessments more. So essentially the idea of uh, assess once, report many, right? And then use it, leveraging resources uh, as it relates to technology as well. And yes. I think that um, no organization likes to repeat their environment or provide evidence multiple times in the year, right? And what if you can use technology to reduce cost resources and time spent on pulling evidence manually. Yes. Personally, I think it's a very redundant process, right? So to your point, I think uh, consulting firms and technology firms that are helping in the compliance industry need to be more proactive and possibly even drive the conversation to help reduce the audit fatigue that you mentioned that most organizations are dealing with, right? Yeah. So in your opinion, how can compliance and consulting and technology firms, you know, be more proactive in, in bridging that gap for their customers? By focusing on what the customer truly wants to create. <laughs> Excuse me, Blaze. Really, the, the biggest shortcoming I see in the organizations that, that we work with, um, organizations in our field, is that the focus is by and large on what it is I have to sell, what it is I can do, as opposed mm -hmm. to what is really a value for you and how can we build a partnership over the long term. And so, you know, when we think of value creation as recognizing desired outcomes at an optimized risk and cost, mm -hmm. and then as partners, what we want to do is create value via shared resources, as you mentioned, it becomes so critical that in the the formation of the relationship that organizations like ours are willing to take a step back and think about what's in the best benefit for the relationship, not just in our own best benefit. And that is, it's not a matter of pushing goods and services, which I think a lot of organiz organizations get stuck in, in the mindset of, it really is a matter of what will create the most value based on what this pertinent organization intends to create. You know, I think with that as the philosophy, that is the mindset, a lot of other things take care of themselves. Secondary to that, I think it becomes really easy from a compliance firm perspective to focus on our people, to focus on our process. From a platform perspective, it becomes really easy to focus on technology. The reality is operations is the overlap of all three of those things, however. It's people, process, and technology. And so we have to be willing to take a holistic view, a truly systemic approach to engaging with and partnering with organizations in such a way that we're bringing to bear really successful and useful tools across all three of those domains. We've got to bring good people. We've got to bring world-class process. We also have to bring some really good technology to the conversation to live up to our end of the partnership. 
So Blaze, I think those two things really become most critical. Well, thank you, Patrick. Very, very great thoughts here. And I think, you know, as a whole, as an industry, we can agree that these trends are not surprising, right? Yes. Um, they're very enlightening. And we it's, it's an eye-opener that we need to do more and be more forward-thinking. Uh, before we went on the break, you, you introduced a notion of operational security and yes. how, you know, a company's process, people, and technology needs to all tie back to operational strategy. Yes. So as we wrap up this particular podcast uh, recording, uh, based on the results of the survey and and um, in your experience, what would be your advice to uh, chief information security officers and technology officers, privacy officers, um, or anybody uh, in this particular security or privacy compliance role? What would your advice to them based on the results of the survey be, and if you can focus a little bit on operational security and privacy, and then scalability as well, you know, because we know cost is always a factor, so. Sure, absolutely. And B, for any of the executives listening, I would listen, A, that is, I would say, you know, now is really the time to stop and think, more than anything, you know, I think to make it to an executive role, I think most people have some sort of bias toward action, which is a good thing. Uh, but right now is a great time to step out of the chaos and really mm -hmm. decide on a direction as opposed to pushing forward. You know, most organizations will have an organizational strategy, how it is we hope to create our org structure so that we can scale globally. We'll have a business strategy, how it is we hope to actually generate a profit, create revenue, and then generate a profit from that revenue. We'll have a technological strategy, you know, how we hope to employ enterprise technology so that we can generate the profit that's called for in our business strategy. We'll even have a risk management strategy. We'll have these robust risk management processes and how we think about minimizing risk in our environment. CISOs, CTOs, <laughs> chief compliance officers also need to seriously consider I would say not even consider need to create their own compliance strategy again to mate with those other three strategies, those other four strategies. It becomes imperative. And the compliance strategy really is just the organization's position on which regulatory compliance, third party compliance, attestations, um, and standards they will incorporate into their compliance program. That's it. You know, with that, we can create a master audit plan, which allows us to lay out graphically, lay out visually, the full body of compliance work that we've undertaken so that we can have a vision. We can understand what winning really looks like. And Blaze, we talked about uncertainty and we talked about blockers earlier. I really do believe by and large, that's one of the biggest blockers for organizations is they just get overwhelmed with fear, uncertainty, and doubt with FUD because you don't know what you don't know, and it feels absolutely overwhelming, and there is no one or no, nothing that can help these leaders have a clear vision, a clear sense of whether or not they're headed the right direction. So in creating a compliance strategy supported by a master audit plan, we believe that allows those leaders to take the first step to doing just that, to getting some clarity, to getting some sense of agency and control, over what it is they really need to be executing against. Now, you talk about operationalizing it. As we think about compliance, we think about control, uh, controlling risk, you, you know, implementing some change, uh, some sort of intervention to minimize risk associated with our critical assets or our critical data. And in general, uh, we'll see that there are three different control types, administrative, physical, and technical controls. And Blaze, I think operationally, really the biggest thing for our leaders to do is once they understand the full body of compliance work they've chosen to undertake, really the next thing to do is to understand the controls that they have employed in their environments and understanding if there are any gaps that they've left that will either introduce more risk or ensure that the risk that they think they're protecting against really and truly is protected. Um, uh, 
trying to think of a clean example, and unfortunately, I'm just dropping a blank right now. I do apologize, but please, I don't, I don't know if I addressed your question. No, excellent. I okay. uh, you met one thing that I particularly liked. You said CISOs or executives have to step out of the chaos. Absolutely, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. And to your clients couldn't get us more chaos at ease, especially in our country. I want you to add international standards to that. If a company is doing any um, international business, it gets a bit more chaotic. So yeah. to your point and your advice there to our, our listeners, I think stepping out of the chaos, taking the time to develop a compliance strategy that aligns with the company's vision, especially as it relates to the day-to-day -day operations, makes total sense. So Patrick, thank you for mentioning that. Okay. And you know, maybe a follow up there. If you had a crystal ball and maybe forecast what uh, the 2024, 2025 and beyond um, uh, compliance benchmark survey results would be, what would your, what would, what would your thoughts be in terms of where the trend will track? What, what do you think will come up, will come up more and more um, yeah. as we call in the next yeah. decade and so? And Blaze, really, really what I'm saying, what we are saying. Uh, by and large, yeah. is a push toward uh, more of the technical tools. Uh, you know, a few moments ago, I mentioned people process technology. More and more, we're seeing AI and machine learning uh, being employed through the various platforms. And more and more, we're seeing legitimate uses for AI and machine learning as it relates to third-party compliance. Uh, you know, I think most people listening at this point are pretty familiar with Chad GPT. Uh, GPT is an acronym for generative pre-trained transformations. So uh, there's this body, it's called a um, large language model. So this body of language that's analyzed uh, that allows us to generate new things when it is queried. And so uh, I think those of you that have used Chad GPT have seen, you can type a question and based on this corpus of previous language, the AI can generate holy language. It can provide an answer that maybe loosely resembles what it is that you've asked. Um, we're seeing organizations using things like GPT to create their security policies. And we're seeing organizations like the Unified Compliance Framework, UCF, which is really one of the leaders in the field as it relates to providing solid structure for control mappings and control overlaps, we're seeing those organizations actually start to provide guidance. So slowly we're seeing uh, people who care, or we're seeing experts who care, move away from the position of let's stop and wait to see what AI and generative uh, LLMs are, are gonna be able to do for us. And they're taking the approach now that people are going to be using these tools. So let's provide solid guidance and solid counsel on how to be successful in using them. And so that's from the market perspective. Blaze as the market goes, so go firms like ours, so go right. compliance yeah. firms. And so very much I see in the next few years, not only a step toward organizations like ours, compliance firms, leaning more on AI and machine learning, I also see us leaning more into uh, the concept of continuous audit or continuous compliance, wherein as enough data sources are provided to continually upload data to the, the model, to the pool, to the platform, whatever the appropriate language is there, whatever the context you want to create, more and more I see organizations being in a position wherein instead of having an annualized event a project we're in, um, a compliance firm comes in to perform an audit and then provide attestation for assurance. More and more, I see this being a thing where a customer organization can say, well, all my data's here, all my processes are here. I now need an attestation saying that I'm good for this customer. We're in a firm, again, very much like ours or any other uh, third-party compliance firm, uh, can come in uh, really with short notice to provide evidence review, to provide um, interviewing, observation testing, all those things that still have to be done to ensure that we honor the intent of the standards, uh, but we're not waiting on these year-long cycles. Because what I also see is that more and more organizations understand 
that an annualized attestation really only attests to a state on day one of that year. 364 days later, as the organization is doing the next attestation, so many things could have changed. And so more and more, as the market demands real assurance, I see the, the overlap of AI and machine learning lending itself to really what we're thinking of as continuous audit or continuous compliance. Patrick, Patrick you're yes. and uh, you mentioned that the idea of artificial intelligence yes. and machine learning, uh, the predictability uh, by leveraging that technology for custom organizations to be able to uh, implement that and align it with your cybersecurity strategy yes. uh, for defense mechanism. I think that can increase our defense mechanism because the cyber criminals will just become more creative with those tools. So we have to be ahead of the of the game and uh, implement a defense strategy uh, to uh, to mitigate those risks, right? Yes. But also mentioned for compliance um, consulting firms like ours, we, we need to take it a notch further. The idea of reactive auditing, it's, it's not going to be sustainable, right? No. With those sort of technology like AI and machine learning, being able to move the ball forward and do a real-time continuous auditing or continuous compliance that provides a snapshot at a particular point in time, depending on the customer's need, and also being able to do even a forecast to say, you know, we can predict that um, and because you are where you are today, in uh, 12 months, here's where you might be and where your risk would be and what you need to focus on, right? Yep. So now you're adding value to the organization back to your to your point earlier of just the goal. Yes. Yes. Adding value. And again, value creation is recognizing desired outcomes at optimized risk and cost. Not lowest risk, not lowest cost, but optimized risk and cost. And so to your point, by employing tools that allow us to not only assess where we are today, but also to some degree forecast, absolutely allows us to optimize that risk threshold so that we we're comfortable with what we've chosen to take on, with what we've chosen to accept, while at the same time still really creating value for our organizations and more importantly for our customers. Patrick, I love it. Thank you so much for your perspective today. Okay. Um, we, because of out of, because we're out of town, we're gonna try to start wrapping up here. And for our audience again today, we discussed Alliance 2023 Compliance Benchmark Benchmark Survey results. Uh, we defined at, at a very high level what the Compliance Benchmark Survey uh, is. Uh, we went over the process on how we uh, we gather those results as well. Uh, why does Align do this on an annual basis? Uh, Patrick outlined the key takeaways and the differences as well from the prior years. And then he provided his very incredible advice. And uh, if he had a crystal ball, which I think is pretty right on that crystal ball, on the work uh, the industry will be from a compliance standpoint going forward. Uh, Patrick, thank you for our Always. audience, for listening to us and joining us today. We hope we increased your compliance perspective. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>